Mr. Cummings? There you are. Um, how much time do you anticipate needing in total, including the testimony from your um, from your property owners? Uh, probably about three to four hours. You're not going to have three to four hours, sir. Um, so um, uh, we're going to start with um, an hour, um, and then um, uh, and then we'll go. From, how much time do you need, Rudy? Mr. Minute. say, and I want to put this on the record, if you cut my time off, I view that as a denial of due process and a violation of federal law. Thank you. Well, this starts out in the, on the right foot. <clears throat> so your position, Mr. Cummings, is that you have as, just as much time as you want? As much time as we reasonably need. And we'll try and to go fast. Okay, but, but we don't, we why, don't, don't, why, don't, why don't we do that? You know, I, I, I just feel that this is, this is a $1,970,000 claim. We believe that due process requires us a reasonable opportunity to present that claim to this board. And you think that takes three or four hours? I think it may. And, and based on your claim that if we don't give you three or four hours, you think that's a violation of federal law? I think if you don't give us a reasonable time to present our claim, that violates the Federal Relocation Act. All right, well, you got your, you've made your record on that. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Dr. Campos, uh, we'll go ahead and start. Uh, welcome to the regularly scheduled meeting of the Board of Public Works for today, Monday, January 29, 2018. Commissioner Repenning, Commissioner James, Commissioner Davis, and Commissioner Jacinto are present. President James, we do have a quorum. May we start with Bureau introductions, please, starting with Bureau of Street Services. Elvin Glenn of Bureau of Street Services. Lloyd Gang, Sanitation. Patrick Schmidt, Bureau of Engineering. Chris Smith, Bureau of Contract Administration. Asad al Najjar, Bureau of Street Lighting. Ted Jordan, Public Works General Counsel. Fernando Campos, Executive Officer. President James, we do not have any speaker cards under general public comment. We also do not have any commentary under the Neighborhood Council comment section. We did receive a speaker card on item number one for today's agenda. Okay, well, we will close general public comment as well as the Neighborhood Council category of commentary. Um, on agenda item number one, let me go ahead and, well, first of all, before we get to number one, is there a second to my motion? Do we have any meeting minutes today? Yes, we do. Dr. Campos, 
dates for Monday, January 8th, January 8th, I've got them right here. I thought we approved those last time, but we've got, is there a second to my motion that we approve the meeting minutes from the meeting of Monday, January 8th, 2018? By Commissioner Repenning, any objection? Without objection, we will approve those meeting minutes. All right, let me call agenda item number one. Agenda item number one, the Bureau of Engineering, Council District 14. Appeal hearing and non-residential relocation claim, La Gloria Foods Corporation, Cesar Chavez, Lorena Street, Indiana Street, Intersection Improvements Project, right-of-way number 33709, uh, recommending that the board concur with the city engineer's recommendation to disapprove all bid items that the city of Los Angeles determined to be not eligible as a moving expense in the July 14, 2017 response to La Gloria's claim for relocation benefits. Um, Mr. Jimenez, we'll start with you. One moment, yes, thank you. Um, and before we get started, this is the only agenda item. Um, the only bureau that's represented today on the item is the Bureau of Engineering, correct, Mr. Jimenez? Correct. Okay, so the other bureau reps, this, I know this will be fascinating, but and if you decide you want to stay, you're welcome to stay, but you're also excused to go back to your uh, regular uh, duties if you, would, uh, if you would like, either now or at any time during the hearing. If you want to stay for a while, you're welcome to do that. It's really up to you, but I want you to know that you're excused if you'd like to be. Uh, so we appreciate that. Um, and Bureau of Engineering is represented uh, with Mr. Jimenez, of course. Um, so, uh, Udi, how much time do you think you need? Uh, I think it's going to take, a, my initial time is going to take between 45 minutes and an hour. Okay. Um, and the, um, uh, the, and I know that the uh, appellant has uh, his statement uh, already with his court reporter and his videographer regarding his statement regarding his time, but he initially indicated uh, a moment ago that he wanted three to four hours and uh, anything short of that's a violation of federal law. Um, I suppose uh, starting out that way, he may have his opportunity to, to take that up, but um, uh, we're certainly going to uh, give him uh, a, a reasonable time uh, to be heard. Um, the one thing that we, uh, that we don't do is we don't put a speaker time limit on um, uh, the real parties in interest, as we call them uh, here. Um, although when they start to repeat themselves, um, then I, I do uh, typically step in, and, um, and if I have to do that today, then I'll do that as well. Um, so um, uh, I had asked him that, uh, that he uh, consider uh, keeping it within an hour, uh, to which he told me we were uh, violating federal law in his opinion. Um, so that is what it is. But. Uh, go ahead, uh, Mr. Jimenez, and we'll start with you, and then we'll we'll hear their appeal. Thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, Udi Jimenez, Chief Real Estate Officer for the uh, Bureau of Engineering. Uh, I'd like to start off uh, making a correction, uh, if we follow the uh, recommendation, because there were some changes made since the uh, July letter. Uh, actually, it should read something like, disapprove all bids that the City of Los Angeles determined not to be eligible as a moving expense as shown in Attachment 3, page 4, or $2,548,541. So that, that is the, the current approved amount. And uh, the reason this change is that since that letter was made, additional items have been approved as a result of further review, and I'll talk more about that in detail as we move along. Okay. Um, this appeal is a relocation appeal that is that resulted from the project. It, uh, the city is proposing to install a roundabout at uh, at an intersection commonly known as Five Points. And uh, it's always had a traffic challenge because there's there's five streets that that um, that empty out into what is now Cesar Chavez, 
in Boyle Heights. Um, and this project has been a long time in the works um, and um, we need to acquire two properties in, in their entirety. We have acquired two properties. One is the La Gloria property and the other one is the La Jolla property, another tortilla factory. Uh, both will be displaced and my experience with city project, in particular this project also, that these projects are designed in such a way to create the greatest public good at the same time creating the least private harm. Unfortunately, La Gloria needs to move to move this project forward. And uh, from time to time, this cannot be avoided. Um, the reason that we're here in particular is, and you're acting as a, an appeals board for the Department of Public Works as a, an appeals board and a relocate regarding relocation matters. Um, there's, uh, w when we typically do relocations, we have to adhere to federal, state law, and local law because this project is federally funded. This and our references are gonna be to federal law. From time to time, there's gonna be re some references to the Caltrans right-of-way manual that um, the appellant has made references and we uh, on occasion make references only as guidance but not as a basis for our decision in whether to determine whether an item is eligible or not eligible for reimbursement. And um, that's why we're here and that's the rule that we're gonna follow, the federal law. Um, again, the project is gonna uh, include uh, the relocation of two properties and a partake of another property. Regarding the La Gloria property, the city uh, acquired the, the real estate and all of the FF&E for approximately $2.2 million as a result of uh, mediation in advance of going to trial. So we, this didn't go to trial. It was resolved in mediation and the agree upon amount was somewhere near $2.2 million. After that, the, the uh, La Gloria filed a claim for relocation benefits, which were not uh, mediated at the time that the city acquired the property. The city acquired all the property, all the FF&E, all the real estate, and left the relocation item to be you, When you right. use acronyms, FF&E? Uh, furniture, fixtures, and equipment, also known as uh, uh, machinery and equipment, M&E. Uh, FF&E is furniture or trade fixtures. Improvements related to, to realty are, is also another word that's used inter interchangeably. Um, so the claim for relocation was filed by on or about October 2015 and the city subsequently at the recommendation of its consultant uh, approved $3.1 million. Everything is listed here in, in, in the letter that you have in front of you. I won't, uh, and you can refer to it, and I'm gonna highlight the important points that the city approved 3.1 million at one time. Uh, the appellant didn't agree to the number and did, made no attempt to relocate. And in order to resolve this issue or to better understand the differences between how the city looked at this and how the owner looked at this, um, uh, the city hired a third independent and unbiased person to analyze the cost, what it would cost to relocate the, the factory from, one, from point A to point B. And uh, the report was generated and uh, by and large, it didn't vary that much from what the cost was shown. But as our cost estimator was not a, a relocation expert, he really made no judgment as to whether the item was eligible for reimbursement or whether it was not eligible for reimbursement. Just verified the cost. And as I said, the cost did not vary very much. How far apart were the costs? So uh, from, uh, from what was proposed versus what the, uh, like what was the kind of a summary breakdown of what the independent uh, expert said versus the two sides? It was about 14% or 560,000, more or less. But who was higher? The, the bids that were reviewed. 
were higher. Both of the bids, he re he reviewed two bids, and both were higher. Than the city? Than the city's uh, estimate. Okay. Um, so um, at the same time that um, the consultant was revise or reviewing these cost estimates, uh, the city took a second look to make sure that um, the items that were being uh, reflected in the bid were actually eligible items. And uh, as we looked at this carefully, we realized that the consultant's recommendation had uh, uh, missed a few items and the city made uh, a, a second determination that the actual amount uh, of the approved amount should have been two million four hundred and seventy four thousand four hundred and fifty four and that was sometime last year in July um, as a result of the city's determination this appeal was made by the owner and appellant sometime in October of 2017 um, and uh, I'll point to um, this, this letter here that you have in front of you, page four. There's a correction on the attachment. Uh, at the top of the page, the attachment reference should be attachment number two, not number one. And I'll go over all of the attachment momentarily. Which letter are you referring to, Uri? The letter that was prepared by me to the file. So that's a correction here. Um, and uh, thereafter, the, the, the appellant filed an appeal uh, in October and is making a claim for what was approved and additionally over and above that, $1,971,442. Uh, and I'm gonna go over more detail, uh, but um, just want to make it clear that everybody understands that the relocation of the operation La Gloria Foods is a tortilla factory that has been in place for over 50 years at the same location and the city realizes that it's a significant challenge and it's a particularly significant challenge not only to the owner but to the city because it this these aren't the kind of things that happen every day it's a uh, uh, and I've talked to several experts who do relocation and few people have relocated uh, tortilla factories. So it's a sort of unique situation, uh, and it's a challenge that I hope that you'll be able to understand as I go through this. So in order to um, respond to this appeal, uh, I put together uh, some attachments that I'll go over now that'll be helpful in your understanding of what is gonna be discussed now and in your analysis in, in order to make your determination as to what is an eligible and non-eligible item to be uh, compensated to the appellant. So the attachment one is simply a few relocation definitions that you'll have th for your reference that w are gonna be discussed repeatedly in both uh, the response and in the appeal. Um, uh, attachment number two is the letter that was sent to the owner in July of 2017, which listed the city's response to the claim and the determination of eligibility and their discussions and references as to whether the items were eligible or not eligible as part of the relocation claim. Um, the third attachment The definitions? Yes, got it. Yes. The second one is a letter. Yeah. I have that. And the third one is a spreadsheet. Is a spreadsheet. And yes. It, it, on the top right corner, it says attachment number three. This spreadsheet, um, just briefly, was uh, a breakdown of the appeal. Uh, the appeal was uh, a narrative appeal. What we did was break down the narrative appeal and described more or less what is being appealed, 
and what the city's determination is as a result of the appeal. So this is current information that is more relevant to the discussion today. Um, I'm gonna refer to this quite a bit, but I'll skip. I just wanted to show you that there's two spreadsheets that look like this. One was prepared by the owner's consultant, which is this one in front of us, the attachment number three. Attachment, num attachment number four is the independent uh, review that was prepared by the consultant hired by the city, ACS. Now, uh, at this point, I wanna make it clear that, um, th as I mentioned earlier, the, the critical point here is to decide whether an item is eligible or not eligible. As far as I'm concerned, the dollar amount is a secondary issue. If the item is eligible, then whatever it costs is what the city is responsible to pay. And the city is willing and able to pay for whatever is eligible as a reimbursement. What, what the determination here and the challenge in front of you is to determine what, 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 what is eligible and what is not eligible and whatever money is attached to that is a secondary issue. So uh, I would disregard for this, for this discussion uh, we're going to not look at attachment four, and we're going to defer to attachment three as the basis for the determination of eligibility. Um, in other words, uh, discussions regarding the city's estimate and the consultant at this point are a moot point because we're basing our determination on what was prepared by the owner's consultant, which is, which is attachment number three. Uh, and I, I hope that'll save lots of time and maybe that'll reduce the time that, that is needed in front of us. So just so we're clear, Ms. Truman, is so you're, you're, con you're conceding the value put forward by the appellants on these items uh, for the city to reimburse. The issue is not the amount that they cost as far as the Bureau of, in of Engineering is concerned. The issue is whether or not they are eligible. Correct. So if we make a determination of, elig of eligibility, then whatever their number is, is the number. That would be fine. Okay, go ahead. That would be fine. And I think that that, that will simplify the process and eliminate a lot of the discussion that's in front of us regarding um, the dispute as to whether we should use the owner's consultant or the city's estimate. So we're going with their number. Correct. And so, Mr. Cummings, just to the extent that that shortens your presentation, I don't know if it does or not, but it's an attempt, it sounds like, to simplify what you would need to present to us. I don't need a response right now. I'm just passing that along to you. So you can, you can address that when, when, when the podium is yours, but that would be uh, what we understand and how we're proceeding. So go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Um, attachment number five is a relocation bid comparison. And, and by the way, just for the record, Mr. Jimenez, uh, Mr. Jordan, um, as our city attorney, I know you have a, or one of your colleagues is here as well. Is, is that, that part of the process okay with you? <clears throat> yes, it is. Okay, go ahead, Mr. Jimenez. Uh, attachment number five is a comparison chart that was made for, you, for your reference to understand the relative uh, relationship between the bid that was provided by the consultant Gates Development, South Coast Contractors was a second bid that was provided by the owner, and ACS is the city's cost estimate review. So um, you could see at the end what the differences are and um, understanding what the conclusion was as far as the city's concerned and the numbers uh, that we'll be looking at and discussing moving forward. Again, the Gates bid is the basis, which is what we'll be discussing in more detail um, in a few minutes. Um, attachment number six, uh, when, when, when the city buys property and has to relocate um, the occupants of the property, the city pays for relocation benefits provided that the 
occupant is eligible for relocation benefits. And sometimes um, certain equipment either costs more money or is too difficult to relocate. Uh, and in this case, it was proposed that uh, to rehabilitate the existing machines that have been in place for many years would cost more money than to buy substitute new equipment. And the city, by and large, approved most of the equipment that was uh, claimed by the owner as far as uh, what was going to be installed at the new location. And the equipment is going to be new equipment that is going to be pre uh, installed by, I'm not sure who's going to install it, but the bid was prepared by Casa Herrera. And this attachment shows um, the total amount of the substitute property, what it's going to cost at the replacement site. The items highlighted in red are those items that we found were not in place at the displacement site. So in order to be relocated, it has to exist at the, at the a displacement site in order to be replaced at the new site. And w those were deducted and the total approved amount of $2.2 Two four one million dollars is the amount deducted with uh, with those items that were not in place at the displacement site, and so the city approved around two point two million dollars for new equipment. The rest of the the rest of the estimate provided by Casa Herrera shows some items that were not in place, so we didn't pay for them. Um, that was uh, number six. So the yeah, difference at the bottom, this is attachment six. You got the zeros. It's, it's, um, yes. Okay. That's correct. And then you got the startup and training of another $110,000 difference. Right. Uh, that one was excessive, uh, according to, uh, the estimate that was provided by, uh, by, uh, by, ACS, and that's what the determination was by ACS. And ACS is the city's consultant. Got it. Go ahead. Um, attachment number seven. Attachment number seven is the the fixtures, furniture, and equipment appraisal that was provided to the city, and it was contracted by the city to. Um, negotiate the purchase of the property and so when the real estate was purchased along with that in mediation this was presented by the city and was used as a basis for negotiation and the purchase of the fixtures and equipment um, the city's total appraised value was 391,000 for the for the non-movable fixtures the rest of the appraisal includes movable equipment. Uh, at this point, the city purchased the non-movable equipment and agreed and is responsible to move the movable equipment. Everything else that is listed here per this appraisal is eligible to be moved. So the movable equipment is eligible to be moved. Whatever is not movable equipment was purchased. And so um, the owner also provided... James, I have a question. I just wanted to ask, or did we... When was that payment made for the non-movable uh, items? It was about the same time. Uh, it was about the same time that the s city settled for the uh, uh, the purchase of the real estate. W the city made an advance payment for three hundred ninety-one thousand, I believe, but the rest of it was settled at mediation. So all things related to the acquisition was finalized at the at the uh, mediation and you're saying this was part of that correct acquisition correct because it's non-movable correct very good thank you uh, attachment number eight is um, the owner's appraisal for fixtures and equipment or improvements relating to realty and um, most of these items are duplicates some of the items vary different and how they were described but all the non-movable items were purchased by the city so there might be some reference in the response or in the appeal itself relative to um, what is going, relative to the discussion regarding the, the, the fixtures appraisals. 
So th those two will be in front of you for you to look at and review. Um, uh, attachment number nine. Attachment number nine is the federal law that we use to make determinations relative to um, any relocation claims that are made. This is the basis of what we use to make um, make our determination of eligibility or non-eligibility. And uh, I hope that you can follow along, and I, I've made some notes here that might make it easier for you as we move along to reference these, these sections. And so on page one of attachment nine, at the top of the page under general, if you could label that item E, and there's going to be some references that will be discussed later. So that first section under general basically discusses what, this, what uh, the owner who qualifies as a displaced person is uh, entitled to payment of his or her actual moving and related expenses as the agency determines to be reasonable and necessary. So the agency here has a lot of responsibility in making sure that the correct uh, evaluations made here. Uh, on the following page, I'm going to skip to item number three, which will be referred to quite a bit in both uh, the review and in the appeal. So item number three, the starting with disconnecting, dismantling, and removing, please label that as item number A, if you don't mind. And that one talks about what is the eligibility, and there's a, a there's a, a different way that the, that the city and the owner look at some of these connections. And in particular, the reference here talks about utilities that can be modified to accommodate the new equipment. And, and this section talks about utilities, and I, if, you, if you underline a some of the words is with utilities within the building, utilities at the site, and utilities uh, at the replacement side. So um, there will be a distinction that will have to be made that is being made by the appellant between utilities that are, that are going to the property and utilities that are within the property. So this reference will be something that we'll discuss further. Um, let's see. Uh, I, one of the things that Further down the page on number 11, these are things that are also eligible for reimbursement. So the city could pay for licenses, permit fees, or certification required of a displaced person at the relocation. However, payment is based on the remaining useful life of an existing license. So if, the, if there's if the two-year license and one year has been used, the city would pay for the second year. We would only pay for whatever's left. And uh, the owner and displacee is also eligible for professional services as the agency determines to be actual, reasonable, and necessary. And that includes planning the move of the personal property, moving the personal property, and installing the relocated personal property at the replacement site. Basically, we take it from point A to point B, what is needed to do that is is covered, and uh, so long as the agency sees that it's a reasonable and necessary item. Um, the next page, on the following page, uh, just a note for you to to look at. Just I would put a little check by this. This is the purchase of personal substitute property. So, in the case that I was talking about earlier, where the city approved 2.2 million dollars. This is the basis that was used. This is the reference in the legal documents that was used to make the determination of what was eligible and what was not eligible. And this is what, what the city used in order to get to that point. Further down on the same page, under letter H, there's a question about ineligible moving and related expenses. If you could label that as item C uh, for future reference, that would be helpful. So these are the things that are ineligible. So what is ineligible is the cost of moving any structure or other real property, a property improvement in which the displacee 
reserved ownership. This is referencing to some of the, like the FF&E or improvements related to realty. Uh, if the owner decides to take that piece that was already purchased by the city, the owner can take it, but the city can't pay for the relocation cost. Uh, we would have to deduct the, what it would cost to sell it or the salvage value in this case. Um, we wouldn't participate in that, but the owner can take the, the, the improvements that are attached to the building that typically would not be taken. So that's under one condition, right? So you could do that. And then on number 10, it says here, these things that are ineligible are physical changes to the real property at the replacement site of the business or farm operation, with two exceptions. The two exceptions is 24301G3, and if you, that's reference number A. Just to make it easier to find, if you could put an A on that one, on 24301G3, when you look at A, it's on, the, it's on the previous page. It'll just be easier to find for you. And then the second reference uh, is 24.304A, which is reference B for your future reference. So when you go to A, that's what, that's what it talks about there, and it'll just be easier to follow. Next page. Um, uh, I'll only point to the top here, a notification of inspection. So um, what this section says here in particular is that in order for the owner to be eligible for payments under the, this section of the law, the owner must permit the agency to make reasonable and timely inspection of the personal property at both the displacement and the replacement site to monitor the move. So this should be a collaboration between the city and the owner to make sure that everything's coordinated and done in a timely manner in order to get reimbursed. So as I talk about reimbursement, I'll, I'll stop here and just take a brief moment to explain that. The whole notion of relocation is talking about where um, the owner would pay for a cost, whether to hire a mover or to do a lot of things that need to be done for the relocation to happen and be reimbursed. That's why a lot of the reference talk about actual payments. You need to spend it, the actual amount, to get reimbursed the actual amount. Uh, from, from time to time, because of certain hardships that are suffered by the displacee, the city can advance money. And for relocation. In, th in this case, the city, the, this, this, the Board of Public Works approved uh, $2.4 million so that the, the owner can get an advance payment of $1.2 million to begin the relocation, and that was rejected by the, by the appellant. And um, a a to date, there haven't been any additional claims other than a few that have been paid. The city has so far paid approximately $17,000 for planning the move uh, by, by Mr. Gates. Uh, uh, he, he planned the, the configuration of the new location and, um, and other things that were provided by Mr. Gates, and I'll discuss that further. He provided a scope of work also. He did some work, so some of the work has been paid, but the bulk of the relocation costs that have been approved have not been requested. Um, we offered to pay half of it, but that has not been accepted to date. Um, um, so further down, uh, talking about um, related non-residential eligible expenses. So this is an important point, again, that will be discussed further. Uh, under 24303, related non-residential eligible expenses, the following expenses, in addition to those provided by 24301 for moving personal property, shall be provided if the agency determines that they are actual, reasonable, and necessary. Um, and uh, item number A, connection to available nearby utilities from the right-of-way. Uh, to the improvements. And so the assumption here is that at the property line, there's power there, and that power can be
provided to the properties. Now, further down on item number B, under 24304, reestablishment expenses. Um, uh, I would just cite a correction in this. Uh, let's see, a small business, the second line, it, it should be 25,000, not 10,000. So a small business is entitled to receive payment not to exceed 25,000 for expenses actually incurred relocating and reestablishment such small business. Question, Uri, is that, this is a, is that, who made that change? Or so that was a part of MAP 21 under President Obama. They updated it and they, they increased uh, the eligibility of some costs and the reimbursement. So reestablishment is, um, is now capped. This is a cap. So those items listed under reestablishment are capped at twenty-five thousand um, dollars. So under that same section, eligible expenses. It says reestablishment expenses must be reasonable and necessary as determined by the agency, and they include but are not limited to repairs or repairs or improvements to the replacement site to the replacement real property as required by federal, state, or local law, code, or ordinance. So as an example, on number one, um, if ADA compliance is required, that would be a federal requirement. And so if somebody has to either stripe the parking, put in a new ADA bathrooms, anything that's required here by the federal, state, or local law is a reestablishment cost. Once you put that in that column, in a reestablishment column, then there could be additional costs that are exceed 25,000, but it's capped at 25,000. This is gonna be an important point because there's some disagreement as to what the city and the owner believes is a reestablishment expense. So the way we looked at it, um, if it falls under this category as a reestablishment uh, expense, that's the way it was considered, and uh, unfortunately, it's capped at twenty-five thousand dollars. Yes. You earlier testified about a fee of seventeen thousand dollars, which we've already extended for its duration. So, Can you clarify that in relationship to the twenty-five thousand. Sure. Um, so the the seventeen thousand that was paid previously was to uh, the consultant uh, that was hired by the owner to plan the move. And that's 100% eligible and not part of reestablishment. So, so far, uh, as part of this discussion, the $25,000 hasn't been accounted for, but they are eligible for $25,000. The second point here, um, on number two, modifications to the replacement property to accommodate the business operation or to make replacement structures suitable to conduct business. So there's two types of modifications that are gonna happen and that typically do happen. Either they're modifications to the equipment or modifications to the building that the equipment's going to. Uh, what this section here talks about is modifications to the building. And uh, there, there's a list of claims that are made and appealed where the city believes that um, these improvements actually make uh, the building uh, a better building with higher capacity that is not allowed. And I'll talk about that in more detail. The distinction here to make is that some of the modifications that will be required are to the building and some are gonna be to the equipment. In this case, uh, what it says here that these are the eligible items. So these are eligible under reestablishment. Okay, what you're gonna do to the building. And then lastly, on uh, number seven on the following page, it's, it lists, in addition to the items that are listed, the city may find that other items are eligible as reasonable and can pay for other items. Just to show that this is not an all-inclusive list and that we try to use good judgment in making the determination. So um, uh, I'll move on to attachment number 10. And attachment number 10 is an appendix to the same federal law. 
it's just an appendix to um, 49 CFR 24. And uh, this is for your information, and I'll point to the third to the last paragraph. And as I mentioned earlier, um, the discussion about whether the city can or cannot base its determination on an estimate, which, which the, the owner is disputing, is clearly stated here. And Pure, uh, clearly what? It's clearly stated here. I would label this as item D, if you don't mind. Third paragraph to the, to the end, it says, if a question arises concerning the reasonableness of an actual cost move, the acquiring agency may obtain estimates from qualified movers to use as a standard in determining the payment. So um, that, that says that the city can use estimates in order to verify that the payments are actual and reasonable. Um, attachment number 11. Attachment number 11 is uh, a, a reference to the California Code of Ref Regulations that was referenced by the appellant that it doesn't apply in here because we're using the federal rules. Just to be clear, but in the appeal, there's, there's references to the California Code of Regulations that do not apply. But I included it for your reference so that you understand uh, where, it, it, when you get to the appeal, how, that, um, how that's pertinent. Are there any gaps in federal instructions in law that will allow California law to be the standard? So, for example, is there some area in which we have that you know of where federal law does not cover it and we follow state law? Uh, not to my knowledge. Uh, it's not, it, the federal law, as you can see, is pretty abbreviated, right? And uh, it talks about what it, what it appears to me to say is that it leaves much of the responsibility to the agency whenever uh, there's a point uh, to be made. And Caltrans acts as a guide. We reference Caltrans all the time when either we need some clarification or to guide us through some process. But nevertheless, we're responsible to comply with federal law. And that's what we do. Um, and uh, attachment number 12 is um, a re another reference by the appellant saying that um, the city should consider only actual expenses and not an estimate. And uh, again, I showed the federal law and uh, in, in all cases, it should be an actual expense. The city acknowledges that and is prepared to uh, assure that all the costs that are incurred are actual and reimbursed are actual and necessary. So, uh, and then the last attachment that I have here, uh, actually I have a couple more that I want to mention, but attachment number 13 is an email that, um, that the owner's attorney will use to uh, try to impugn my integrity, saying that uh, the city uh, directed uh, the consultant to some certain conclusion. As you read this email, uh, it was a result of discussion between one of my employees and the consultant, and uh, it references that discussion, and I'm, I've been an appraiser for over 30 years. I've never changed the value of my appraisals, and I've never asked anybody to change their appraisal, and whatever their opinion is what it is. To me, this email looks to be a result of a discussion that discusses corrections, not direction. And so, uh, but I wanted to bring it to your attention. Point of clarification. Sure. We have no comment or remarks from the consultant complaining about our interaction or communication sending these cases. No, I, I, don't, I don't know of any. Thank you. Um, so, I'll go back. Those are all the attachments. If we go back, if you, if you don't mind, to uh, attachment number three. And there are approximately 20 items that are being appealed, more or less, maybe, maybe more. But um, what I want to do is to point out, again, this is a summary 
of the appeal. So what we did, we kind of digested the appeal and did a, a for your for your reference to better understand what is being appealed. For example, so Udi, just yes. so we can get to this, we spent about the 45 minutes going through telling us what the attachments are. Um, do is is this the exhibit that? First of all, tell me if, if this exists. Because we're, we're down to what's eligible and what's not. Correct. Okay, because you took the cost issue off the table. Correct. So we have a list of what's eligible, and they have a list of what they think is eligible, correct? Yes. Okay, and there's a delta between those two. Correct. And you think that delta ends up being the $1.9 million additional money that, that their council's already referenced. Is that right. fair enough? Yes. Okay. Is that where you're going here? Yes. So, uh, that's what I'm most interested in. Okay. About. So, this is a line by line um, breakdown of their appeal. You can use it for the, your reference, but if you go down to the back of this spreadsheet. And you're on either three or four. Uh, three. Three. Got it. Okay. <laughs> Take a sorry, just get here. Um, yeah. Can we just take a just a step back, even? Sure. So, um, in order to uh, uh, build the infrastructure element that we're looking for here at this roundabout, we needed to um, acquire property involving the relocation, and including a, a, a business location, a manufacturer, um, and so part of our due diligence as the city is to relocate uh, that. That company. So we went and purchased property. Uh, how much did we spend on that property? Uh, approximately $1.8 million. Okay, so we purchased the property, and on that property was a, a, a building already? Yes. So, okay. yes. There was a building with a tortilla factory in it. Right. So, at question it, at, at this point, our Relocation expenses for existing equipment, are those in question or are those already done? Yes, so both the purchase of the equipment is in question. Part of it is, uh, most of it was approved by the city. Some of the equipment is being claimed and appealed. And then in addition to that, there's some other, um, what is being appealed is what's going to happen to the replacement building. What are the costs incurred in actually moving? So the big uh, item of contention here is what is the city obligated to pay for in terms of improvements to the building in order to have create a facility uh, for uh, that business to go and provide the same level of services that they were providing in the Correct. location? Okay, thank you. Correct. Thank you, Commissioner Penny. Go ahead. Okay, so um, again, there's, there's quite a bit of detail. Uh, there quite, there's quite a bit of detail that's used for reference and the I'll just point you to the column on the right under comments the determination that was made was explained here as a result of the appeal so some items were subsequently approved and those items are listed under yes per city review in the third or fourth column from the from the right so we approved some items that had not been approved. Um, and we made the adjustment from the city's estimate. So there's to the two district. steps of approval. You got the uh, approval initially, then they filed the appeal, and then based on the appeal, we had some additional approvals. Correct. Go ahead. Correct. And so um, the original determination, uh, uh, it's going to take some time to go through the appeal itself, so I'll abbreviate this, but you understand what this is. Yep. So the uh, second, uh, the third column from the left talks about what has been approved. 2.4 million, 2,449,454 2, plus reestablishment comes to a total of $2,474,454. As a result of the review, an additional 74,000 has been approved. And so the total amount was the amount that I read to you earlier that should that the city recommends, which is one minute. 
So the recommended amount, the total recommended amount for approval now is two million five hundred forty-eight thousand five hundred fifty-one dollars. And so the one point nine million has been reduced by about. So it's really close to one point nine instead of one point nine seven one. Correct. Exactly. So it's really close to one point nine. Right. Got it. Okay. So. Uh, uh, one of the things, you know, in, in doing this review and, and trying to understand where we, where we missed the boat here or whether there was a, how this. Let me ask a question. Sure. Oh, one moment. Ted. got the 1.9 million. You've got the, the appellant and their able counsel sitting here. Was there any attempt to settle this thing? Um, so relocation, as, as we mentioned earlier, is an actual cost. We don't really settle these items. It costs whatever it costs. If it costs a million dollars and it's a reasonable expense, then that's what the city is responsible to pay. So you're saying we don't really have the authority to... to you, the, the agency itself doesn't have the authority to, to bargain it. No, not really. Uh, you, the, the owner might end up in a worse condition if he or she misunderstands the regulations, and we okay. need to make sure that we pay every, every dollar that's due. Mr. Jordan, is that something that the Board of Public Works has the authority to do? I mean, that may be what we end up doing here, but, but maybe we can find a way to do it that doesn't put both parties in federal court? I think the, uh, what the board is going to be considering is uh, whether certain items are eligible for expense, you know, for reload, you know, for uh, payment. Uh, although certain items, you know, may fall into that category of reestablishment expenses, which, while eligible, are capped. Right. Understood. But maybe we can't do this. But one thing this board, I think, prides itself on trying to do is sending both parties out the door satisfied. Um, and we, we've done that. We had a hearing. It was a settlement hearing right here in open. This isn't court, per se, but right here in the open Board of Public Works. We had a very public settlement hearing with Kemp Brothers that we kept both sides out of court. We negotiated it right here on the record in the public light of public day. Um, I'm just wondering if um, or the public light of day, I should say. Did I say that right? Whatever. It, it was bright outside. Um, I'm just wondering if there's any interest. I don't know if there's been any interest by the appellant. Um, uh, in, and we'll, I'll, I'll let him interrupt your presentation for a moment. Udi, just on this issue, because I, I don't know if you even have any interest in that. Well, uh, to be very clear, one, we have negotiated settlements and relocation many times. In this case, uh, Judge Romero, who was the mediator for the eminent domain case, he offered to provide his time for without charge to either party for a further mediation on the relocation, and Mr. Jimenez repeatedly refused that offer. I have made that offer many times to John Minor. He will not con uh, dispute that. And I, this, I cannot understand why we are here. This case should have been resolved many times before. Okay, thank you, sir. I think, and I, I apologize for your frustration there, sir, I, and in defense of Mr. Jimenez on that, I think it's likely because Mr. Jimenez doesn't have the authority to agree to that, but we do. Um, and so, is that your understanding, Mr. So, Jimenez? my understanding is that the agency is responsible to determine what is reasonable. Yeah, yeah. So, and so, and, and so we, and we, Mr. Jimenez's bureau reports to this board, so um, I, I almost am interest a little more interested because if we if we decide and in taking the time that we have today, and we still have time today, obviously, I'm a little more interested in turning this into kind of a Kemp Brothers type hearing, where we might be interested in hearing from Mr. Cummings, because I'd like to keep, we can pick what's eligible and what's not, and then he runs off to federal court, and we both spend a lot of, the, the, the appellants spend money on, 
on lawyers and, and that, and, and we spend our money on our lawyers, when we actually can work it out right here, and Mr. Cummings satisfied, the appellant satisfied, and nobody goes to court. Um, so uh, I, I'd almost be um, interested in, um, in, 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 in attempting to go down that road. You wanted to say something, Udi, in, in response? I was just going to continue. Uh, are you, how close to you are wrapping up? It depends on how far you want me to go. Uh, I just wanted to talk, I'll, I'll tell you, so where I was going is I was going to talk about one additional attachment, and then my plan was to go over the appeal and itemize those issues that, and, and okay. how we Finish the attachment. It. Okay. And then before you go over the appeal, I've got a couple of questions for Mr. Cummings. Okay. So the last one is the one that you were handed earlier today, which is, so in trying to understand why we are so far apart, in t both in terms of what was eligible and how things were identified, how the, the estimates came out differently, how all this situation came up. So we looked at the scope of work that was provided to the contractors to try to understand whether the contractors had the correct direction in order to come up with an estimate. And what we found was that the scope of work is somewhat flawed because it makes certain assumptions that are not correct. And I'll draw you to this bottom uh, paragraph under general contractor, the second sentence. It says that all F&E and personal property are re required to be relocated. Well, this is an incorrect statement because the city owns the, the, F, the fixtures and equipment that are attached and the owner can't take it without some prior agreement. And so some of the items that came out in the, in the bids are reflected even though they should not have been because they're not owned by the, by, they're no longer owned by the owner of the property. Would you uh, clarify the question, where did this um, scope of work come from? So this scope of work was prepared by Gates, the owner's consultant, in trying to get uh, solicit bids from uh, potential contractors to do the work. So that was the owner's consultant. And so um, in that section, he said that all relocation was, was uh, all items were to be relocated, but that, that should not have been the case. Um, uh, let's see. And then another assumption that was made at the bottom of page two, under Department of Water and Power, it, it's a, this is an incorrect assumption because the city cannot approve these costs. The city had not approved these costs, and the assumption was made that the city would do these things because uh, neither the owner nor the city have agreed to pay for this. This is an assumption that is not correct. And then um, there's additional references uh, in the F and E list on the following page, which would be page three, under F and E list. This is an uh, this is this is uh, an assertion on the last second to the last sentence. This the business intends on relocating all of the items on both lists. That means the movable and non-movable items. However, all items on Exhibit A are to be considered reestablishment expenses. That is not correct. And the reference on that is item number C that I asked you to highlight in the federal regulations. Um, so that, that is an incorrect uh, direction that was given in the scope of work. Um, and then in the project manual, uh, there are some references here with respect to how the food processing areas have to be done and fire sprinklers and other required health and safe health department items. If you recall, there's a, a, those things that are required by federal, state, or local law would fall under reestablishment. And so the direction here is not correct. And uh, there's other parts here of the section here that the scope of work is, is flawed, not completely correct, which may have resulted in, in incorrect bids that were provided to the city or that caused this misunderstanding between what is eligible and what is not eligible. Uh, and there's a, 
there's a few items like, for instance, uh, at, towards the end, I, 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 will, I'll, I won't go through each one, but there's locksmith services. Uh, the, the scope says, I think it's, this is the second to the last page. Uh, it says, um, provide locksmith to rekey the entire facility on a master key system per the owner's request. That's clearly not reconnection of the machines or any relocation item. And these are some of the directions that were given by the consultant may have resulted in a skewed bid that we had to review and then eliminate those things that were uh, reestablishment, recategorize them correctly, and then come up with a different result. So that's what we did, try to, trying to understand why the disparity, why the discrepancy between the city, the way the city looked at this and the way the owner looked at it. And we found that the scope of work was missing and it has some issues. Uh, already question, the scope of work that came from the owner's consultant, or do we as a city create our own scope of work and direction? So I don't know why it was done this way, particularly I was not involved in the day-to-day -day, uh, activity, but typically the scope of work is determined by the agency and the owner in collaboration. Say, okay, you bought this, you can't do that, so the contractor, the contractor should uh, give us a bid for these items. Uh, that was not done in this case. It appears that uh, Gates did this independently, uh, and that's why some of these items showed up the way they did. Um, that's all I have for now. What I was planning to do, and you can gauge the time, was to go over all the narrative that was prepared in the appeal and, and, and give you our response to the narrative that was summarized in the spreadsheet. Well, but he'll have point. the opportunity to present his appeal. Yes. Mr. Menez, go, going back, though, to this issue on the scope of work, that sounds like that that's not the way we normally do things. We normally agree on a scope of work and then we present it for bids. That's typically the way it's done so that there's no misunderstanding like there could be, could have been in this case. It just makes makes sense that, um, and then, you know, the bids, ah, sh sh should come, the bids should come to the agency. The agency reviews them for how appropriate they are. And, and I think the bids went directly to the owner and that caused some confusion too. The bids went directly to the owner? Right. That's my understanding. That's a, that, that, the that's a way they're addressed. So, all right, so now it sounds like we've got a, a bid problem. Possibly. And if we've got a bid problem, I feel maybe I'm more interested in trying to settle this now than before even. If I've got a bid problem, it almost sounds like we need to, if we were to go out for new bids, how long would that take? Well, it, it would depend on access. Uh, one of the things that the agency has the discretion to do is to hire contractors and consultants and pay them to prepare that. So in this case, or if there's a question of time or urgency, the city and the agency can pay for the cost of preparing the bids at an expedited rate uh, or time frame and that could be three to four weeks so you could have fresh bids that went through the proper process in four weeks outside right so it might come down to the same question because in in preparing the scope of work the owner and the agency have to agree on these things that are eligible right so that's if that's still in dispute uh, Maybe that needs to be resolved before we can get bids because if, uh, if there's disagreement on that, I don't know if we can agree on a scope of work. We have to agree on a scope of work that's reflective of the, the laws that we have in front of us.
Yes, that's correct. Uh, that that shows the basis of the bids and whether and and to me, as I as I noted, uh, that that could be the root of at least some of the disagreement. Okay, um, Commissioner Sinto, do you have anything else? Okay. Um, I, I guess, thanks, Mr. Jimenez. Um, Mr. Cummings, um, I, I think, I don't want to interfere with your presentation at all, obviously, and I want you to have your reasonable amount of time. I guess I remain interested in, in whether or not your clients would be interested in, in a settlement proposal that we could consider, and I recognize you may not want to put that on the, the public record here, but I'm happy to recess this for a little while if that's something that interests you or, or not. I, I, I guess I'm interested in hearing from you on that. We would be interested, excuse me, we would be interested in anything that can bring about a resolution in this manner on a reasonable basis. I did not mean to offend you when I stated that I was making a record, but because of the way things were handled well, in I'm this not case, offended. <laughs> uh, I, I, I know felt, what you have to do. I, I felt that I had to do that so there could be no claim that I had waived rights to put on evidence. Okay, I respect this board very deeply, believe me. And, and Mr. Yacinto came out to, to look at, our, at the property, and he inspected it this past week uh, with Mr. Miner uh, and my partner, Gary Kovacic, and Fernando Ruiz, sitting right here from LaGoria. Uh, but, you know, we, this is an extremely important item to the, to the uh, Manuel Behar and Antonio Behar families. We're dealing with the second, third, and in effect, their children are the fourth generation, okay? This, this business supports eight members. But of, I'm just trying to find family. it right now. If you know, we you, we if want to, we're willing to, to discuss anything Mr. Gates is one of the most knowledgeable people in relocation you can find. He's done more than a thousand relocations. He's an expert in relocation. So we would be glad to do anything that facilitates the process. You tell me what you think will work best and we will work with you. Um, well, I, I think I think you, you might need to listen to Mr. Gates because he, he can deal with these categories very well. Because, he, look, I'm not an expert in relocation, but that man is. And you need to listen to him because he can explain it to you. He can cite, in effect, the chapter and verse as far as the federal regulations. He can tell you exactly why every category that we've listed is one that is permissible in under his claim and under the law. So I, I would really like, and I've, I've got my clients here, they're just they're wonderful people. Uh, and I've represented the Behar family for over 40 years. So I am passionate about them. Uh, I, I used to have hair, and it was, it was brown. But, you know, they're, they're really good people. And I've seen this business survive and, and provide for their family. And I don't want that to be lost. And I think Mr. Gates can assist you in going through the categories and explain to you what's important. And we can do off the record, if you want to, in a settlement discussion, whatever works for you. Um, so I, 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 think, um, I think it's worth while. Um, I, I don't mean to, to I don't, it's not like I'm just trying to take the emotion out of it. I understand that they're good people and they've been in the community a long time and we appreciate that. That's important, Commissioner Sinto. I know that he went to, and, and did a visit. I think Mr. Jordan, our city attorney, went as well. Uh, Mr. Campos, our executive officer, may have gone. Um, uh, I'm just trying to get a resolution. Um, and this um, And I uh, think that it might make sense uh, for us because you can make your presentation, we can make a determination, and then you all decide whether or not you're going to go go to, to federal court. I feel like if we do this off the record initially today, um, we might be able to get to uh, a number 
Um, although I've got to, let me ask a couple of questions of my legal counsel here. Mr. Jordan, what, I guess, are we allowed, if, are we allowed to do this off the record? We do, do we violate the Brown Act? Well, uh, the, the, the board itself cannot have any meeting off the record. You, you, I mean, staff can, uh, an individual commissioner. You can meet with two of us. Yeah, yeah. It, Typically, this is done at a staff level, and then they come back and make a recommendation. Okay. So, One thing, if I may say, is the Mr. Savarth, who was the consultant hired by the city, and in, in the white binder I provided you, uh, there's a chronology, which I think is really important to look at. And I, I put it, it's Exhibit 29, but it's also on the inside uh, sheet of the binder. In Mr. Zavark's original independent uh, estimate was $4,232,466. That's the city's consultant. Then the staff talked to, to him, and they got him to decrease it to $3,997,000, and he stated that there was no betterment. That's why that email is really important and if you look at so here's what I'd be inclined to do I've read the email oh. I, I'm inclined to uh, to hear from your expert witness there um, let's have him give us his best hour okay. and then what I think colleagues I mean obviously you guys can chime in and let me know but I think after we hear that we get a sense of from both sides what we're looking at. Since we can't uh, negotiate a settlement off the record, we can do it here in, in public. You can decide if you want to do it here in public or if you want to have discussions off the record, we can direct the Bureau, we can give the Bureau some direction to see if they can get um, uh, 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 yeah, a, a, closer to a, a number that works for both sides. I'd, I'd rather do it on the record with you folks. Oh, okay. I Great, that makes it easy. That makes yeah. it easy. Does All right. Mr. Gates come up here? Great. I'd rather have you talk to him. He knows it. Okay. Okay. I, I don't know it as well as he does. All right. Is that okay with everybody here? prepare the scope of work. He can go through and explain that to you. And he can explain how every one of these categories that he's, that's been referenced, why under his interpretation of the federal regulations, they are permissible. Can he go through the items that the Bureau identified as areas where in fact they differ? Uh, we just went through that's that. That's what he's going to do. Yeah, he, he can do that right now for you. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. To, thank you, sir. To Commissioner Davis's point, we're interested in the Delta. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good morning. Name, rate, name, rank, and serial number, sir. Randy Gates. Randy Gates with Gates Development Company. Okay. I've been doing relocation for over 36 years. I have... Um, been involved in over a thousand relocation cases. I've moved everything that you can imagine. Can you hear me? There you go. Excuse me. Uh, so I could go on for hours, but I really don't need to. I can hit certain areas and get you, I think, if I'm gathering what you're trying to do, get the gist of it. Um, First off, I, I just kind of want to explain what relocation is. It, it, for somebody who hasn't done it, and I don't think anybody in this room, including the city, has ever done it, um, it can be quite um, exhaustive. It doesn't matter what the business is. It could be a donut shop for 50000 or it could be a food processing plant for $4 million. There's a lot of details. 
and if you own the donut shop and you it was yours and you went to the various agencies to build the donut shop because you, you need to relocate they're going to get how involved it is with the county and the city and so on and so forth so there's a lot that goes into it so what it, how it starts is the condemning agency whoever it might be uh, they, they have a they have a property they want to do something to. they want to build a bridge they want to build a freeway whatever and there might be one two three fifteen businesses in the way okay and they'll hire an appraiser to come out ff any appraiser uh which which i like to call fixtures and equipment personal property okay and they'll come out and put a value on that and that values uh, that report is in two sections one is called improvements pertaining to the realty and one is called new there, there, there's real no di distinction there except for a couple of things. The improvements pertaining to realty uh, prices are put in as best as the appraiser can, and many times it's a guess. So he's going to put in three prices, what he considers fair market value in place. It's a, it's a depreciated cost, a salvage value, and a replacement cost new. Okay, And at, a at the end, they get it to the bottom line. And many times uh, the city or the agency will try to get um, that purchased with a check. In this case, that happened here. Then you have your movable list where prices may or may not be put, but it doesn't matter because movables themselves aren't purchased by the agency. They are moved. Okay? So there's a distinction on that. So in reviewing thousands of these, I find that appraisers uh, do a pretty good job. There's a good list of them in here that, that, that do it, and once the city hired here, did a fine job. Of course, they're not going to catch everything because maybe when they're going through there, they just didn't see it. And so I take that list, and I go through with a fine-tooth comb, and that, uh, I validate what they've got on the list and what they might have missed. In this case, um, the tortilla factory has two lines when I got there, but when the appraiser got there, there was only one line. So there's a difference right there. Uh, and we brought that to the attention of the city, and um, I think we've come to an agreement that two lines need to be relocated. Okay. So from that point, um, to put together a relocation bid, scope of work, we need to have a certified inventory, and, and, then, and actually the owner needs to get two bids. Those are the requirements of the code. Okay. So actual relocation is this. A person like myself who's got the experience will go through and, and investigate and clarify what it is going to take precisely to disconnect, dismantle, transport with insurance, modify and reinstall the new location. That's relocation. And, and most general contractors don't want to get involved in that because there's a lot of things in relocation that general contractors don't want to do, but they're required to do in relocation. We don't have to get in the specifics, it's just different. So it is an exhaustive uh, approach. In this case, it took me four or five months to do that. And I did create a scope of work. And I want to clarify that the scope of work is not provided by the city. It never is. So if the city thinks that it is, it's never. It's never done that way. So the scope of work is used. Now, uh, on many cases, the scope of work will be created and then uh, submitted to the agency for their comments. At some point, they did get it, and there were no comments until two and a half years later, because this has been going on since 2015. Okay. So what we try to do is something called a low-cost approach. For instance, this desk that you're sitting at, it's not connected on either end. It's just connected in the middle. The cost would be to come in and disconnect it. It's put on a truck, transferred over, reconnected. That's the cost. Very simple. If this, connect, if this was connected to, uh, in some way to a corner and it had to be rebuilt, then we have to decide, is it cheaper to just build a new one with a carpenter? Or should we take it apart, cut it apart, and modify it? or should we buy a new one or a good used, okay? That's an example, and that, that carries through with everything. For instance, you might have a task light. A light might be worth $150, but 
but take it apart and change the ballast, put it all in. If that's $300, why not just get them in your life? So that's called the low-cost approach. I have that written out. You have a copy of it, and that was provided to the city. So that's the thought process that goes into determining what the scope of work is going to be. In this case, uh, since I was hired as a consultant to, this is a very complicated case. Uh, anytime you have something to do with food processing, it's complicated. It's not a restaurant, which is, can be complicated, but it's a food processing plant. So the county health department looks at it as, as a much higher level. And they have to because they're processing food, and if something goes wrong, people are going to get sick. Okay? Okay, so then I create a bid schedule. It's blank in this case, and the bid schedule covers items that are needed. Now, the scope of work I provided was hundreds of pages long, hundreds of pages. And the city pointed out uh, correctly that one of, the, one of the pages had a document regarding um, locksmith services. That's actually not a relocation cost, okay? It might be something that has to get done. It could be reestablishment. Now, the bid schedule did not reference locksmithing because when I put the bid schedule together, together I didn't go back and reference 10,000 words of the, of the scope of work. But the bid schedule told the contractors who were going to bid the job, experienced relocation contractors who know what they're doing, this requires a number. You put the number in, whatever you think it is. And locksmithing wasn't included. But let's say it was included. Okay, well, that will go in the category of reestablishment. So reestablishment is capped now at $25,000. The city's correct on that. In this case, I think the reestablishment costs were $68,000. Well, well, nobody's expecting the city to pay over the $25,000. That falls to the owner. The owners understand that. And that happens on every job. Okay? Although, you know, personally, I think ADA bathrooms, which is a carbon federal law, should be, should be included. If you have ADA bathroom, let's say, at, at your one facility and you're moving to another facility and you don't have ADA bathrooms, it seems fair to me that you would get them paid for. But they're not. Or at least they're not paid in relocation and capped at 25000 reestablishment. Okay. So reestablishment capped at 25000 So what is relocation category? It has many costs, some of them which are not... Uh, addressed in my bid scope at this time. For instance, the actual actual moving costs, they're going to be determined later. Things like re-lettering, reprinting of their letterhead, boxes, t-shirts, whatever, is, is an allowable cost, but we didn't take a look at it at this time. A few others. Okay, the other important thing to understand about relocation, this is really important. Relocation costs are not based on where they're coming from. They're based on where they're going. This is really important. For instance, this is the easiest way to explain it. They, they need a thousand amps at their old place, and where they're moving to, they have a thousand amps of power. There's no cost to modify the electrical system with regarding the amps at all. Vice versa, if they need a thousand amps, and where they're going, they have 500 amps, then the, the, the service would need to be modified to connect the equipment. Okay, so that's relocation. Everybody get that? Okay. Now, I um, put together the entire package. Two bids were obtained. They were submitted to the city. That was back in October of 15. And here we are still. The city's been delaying for various reasons. I have my own opinion on why they are. I think it's just a lack of money and, and the lack of their um, uh, ability to understand this particular relocation case, it, I understood something to the fact of $250,000 is what they had for relocation. See, the city is very good at acquisition. They know what the property costs. You get an appraiser, real estate appraiser, it's worth a million dollars, here's a million dollars, we're done. If they're going to purchase the improvements pertaining to realty, and they're worth $30,000, here's $30,000. You're good to go. But the other factor, and this is where I find in my 36 years all the time, that the agencies don't understand what relocation costs. In their mind, it's $10,000 to build a donut shop, and that can't happen. Okay, in their mind, it was $250,000 to move with Gloria, not even close, as you now know. And so they're not doing their due diligence on the front side, and that's why we're here. Okay, so from then on, um, I want to I move to... 
the city's hiring. Actually, the city did not initially hire Ron, Ron Savart. He was hired by the city's consultant. And the first report was addressed to the consultant of the city, which is DRA, Dell Richardson and Associates. When you read that report, I, Charlie, we have it in the, okay, okay. When you read that report, I want you to know how that came about. The city said they wanted to hire a third party consultant. And I said, fine, they're within their right, that's their due diligence. And so uh, we made an appointment to go out there to the existing facility. And before that happened, or at that time, I gave him the entire bid package binder in a three ring binder. It's four inches thick. Okay, so he did some studying. He came out, he did a personal uh, walkthrough of the existing facility and took photos and, and what have you. And then we took him over to the new facility, which is where they're relocating and is where the costs are born. And I walked him completely around and showed him everything, answered every question he had. Uh, then he ended up, after a couple of months, I think, finishing a report. And in that report, he states that the scope of work is the most detailed thing he's ever seen. And uh, obviously, it looked like it took months to do. He talks about uh, what my qualifications were, and he, and he talks about um, the condition of the equipment, and, and so on and so forth. And then his number comes in, and, and somebody mentioned that his price was 14% less than, than mine. The price was 0.03%. That's how close it was. Now, who is this guy? He is an expert in estimates, an expert. He's won all kinds of awards. That's how the city got a hold of him. So he came out, he looked at the site, he went through my scope of work, he went through the equipment, he went through both spaces. He comes up with a report and he says, look, the, Mr. Gates's numbers are absolutely correct and they're completely detailed. He looked at the other bids. And he also states that the costs are going to go up if we continue to delay because in construction costs go up, they don't go down. And that's exactly what's happened over three years. The costs have gone up. We've had increases several times just because we had to update the bids. And it's been really frustrating. Frustrating for the owner, frustrating for everybody. And we have had this standoffish uh, approach from the city trying to bully us, push us around, and it's, it's been very difficult. So since then, he, uh, you know, he, he submits the report and the city gets it and they don't like the number. The reason they don't like the number is, and it's the number that they're worried about, not the wording. I don't know. They said much about the, the, the praises that, I, that he uh, reaped on me, but they didn't like the number because they didn't have the money. So they told him, we want you to lower the number. We want you to change some wording here and there, take out a word here and there, take out a whole paragraph, add some paragraphs to your report, which is supposed to be independent. It's, it's like crazy. So he does it, he does the report and they get it and they still don't like it, it's still too high. So he does it again, now the number is even lower. So he finally turns the number in and it's, it's lower, but it's not, it's not like, you know, 80% lower, but it's lower. They have the number and they still don't know what to do with it. It's still too high to them and, and they can't make them do it again. So the city really, with I'm, I'm gonna say, without any knowledge, they don't know what they're doing. They have no experience in whatsoever and they just go through and chop it up and so the response that you got that we got uh, attempts to go through each and every line item and cut costs and they're doing that in, in, in several ways they're, they're calling it betterment or they're calling it uh, reestablishment or they're just saying it didn't exist or we don't want to pay for it or it's just too much money and I want to explain something in a relocation project, estimates are not allowed. They're not allowed. They're specifically written. They're not allowed. An estimate has no value to the federal or state regs because there's nothing at risk. And a relocation cost submitted and approved, there 
there are no extras in projects. You know, you've always heard of projects that are coming at a million dollars and they end up $20 million. That doesn't happen in relocation. And the reason is, is because they require a firm, fixed fee, lump sum bid, period. It could be one number. That's the written requirement. In the same way I bid federal projects, uh, you name it, military, whatever, they don't care how much you're paying your carpenters, they don't care, they want to see the bottom line, whose bottom line is lower. They want a firm fixed fee bid. That's what was provided. Now, in my 36 years plus, I have sought to make it more understandable than a bottom line. How could it be $10,000 to move this? So I break it out into categories, and in those categories, subcategories, so that the reviewers at the agency where it's Caltrans or the city, they have no idea what costs mean. They have no idea how that number is put together. At least that gives them an opportunity to go, okay, I kind of see that, okay? But it's really a, a lump sum bid. What the city tried to do after the third revised uh, um, report from Ron Sarvik was to then turn around and cherry pick. Well, the low bid had a line item for electrical at 80,000, and after we got him from 81,000, he might have even higher. We got him down to 62,000, that's what we're proving 62,000. They don't have that right to cherry pick line items as if they were bid individually. They're not bid individually. You bid as a lump sum. They don't have that right to do that. And I just think it's appalling. Now, in terms of betterment, I want you to understand something. Betterment is exactly what it means. If they have six lathes in the machine shop, and they want to relocate, and they want seven lathes, that seventh lathe is a betterment. Everything to do with that lathe, the electrical, the foundation, you name it, is all a betterment. And they don't have to pay for it, not in any way or form. However, um, in the case of equipment, there are many regulations that say a, a piece of equipment, like say here, right here in the city of Los Angeles, who has the strictest uh, UL uh, inspection service in the state, the strictest. So you're not going to install anything in the city of Los Angeles unless this, I see a UL certification. It's an equipment, equipment certification that says it's safe to operate. In order to do that, there's a process. And that process is uh, complicated. You have to hire an independent, third-party, city-approved inspection team like UL. They come in and inspect the equipment. They write a report. And then they tell you these two pieces are okay, but the rest of these, they have to be modified to make them current or I'm not going to let you install them. So then they have to be modified. And then once they're modified, then they have to come back and certify that you did it correctly. Then they put a stamp on it, send it to the city for release. The inspector will release the job. Okay, so that's why these things are so complicated. It's not as simple as pick it up and move it and install it. So if a piece of equipment is going to take $500,000 to relocate, modify, and reinstall, and a good used one could be purchased for three ninety, dollars then as a contractor, we're going to bid three ninety dollars because we certainly want to bid $500,000. If somebody bids three we're not getting the job. Does that make sense? That's the low-cost approach. And that works out best for the city. Why should they spend $500,000 when they can get three ninety? dollars so, in this particular case, the tortilla factory equipment is all custom made. Okay, you, you can't go to the shelf and buy it. You're not going to go to the restaurant equipment supply and buy it and get it at Routes. Okay, it's 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 very expensive. It's big. They make hundreds of thousands of tortillas every day, 24 hours a day. Now, the equipment they have, there are two main suppliers of this equipment. Two main suppliers. Casa Herrera, which they have about 80% of their equipment in their factory, and there's another supplier called Superior, and there's a couple others here and there. And so I went to Casa Herrera prior to the bidding and walked all the equipment with them and got their expert out there. Because although I am an expert, I can't be an expert to the 10th degree in everything, so I brought equipment manufacturer out there. They took a look at it and they went, yeah, okay, uh, we can move all this stuff, but and they wrote me a letter, and it's in your, it's in your uh, binder there, and it's called Relocation Versus Replacement. 
the cost to relocate the equipment, including modification, certification, UL, all of it, was, was quite a bit more than buying good used or new. So I made the determination right up front, we're going to buy good used or new, and we're going to get it from Casa Herrera. And we submitted that to the city. And when we had a mediation with Judge Romero and Mr. Minor and everybody there, the discussion came up as, why do you have only Casa Herrera bidding the job? Because in the two bids that are required, each bidder used the Casa Herrera bid. That's the only instance, one bid. So I agreed we would go to Superior and get a second bid. If that's what the city wanted, we'd absolutely do that. It came back and it was more money. It was more money. So I submitted it. We'll pay the more money if you want to. If you want to pay for it, we'll pay the more money. But it makes more sense to buy from Casa Herrera, who's the cheaper price, and that's what, what we stayed with. So we talk about betterment. There isn't any betterment. In my type response, which is what, 15,000 words, 19,000 words, I go line by line, since I thought it would come down to this. The city went line by line in my bid and said, this is approved, this isn't approved, or we're approving this, but the lower amount, they made that up, by the way, they're not allowed to do that. And almost in every case, they got the uh, submitted number wrong. But I clarified that. I'm not going to read my, all of that. It's just, it would take me hours, but you can read it. But I addressed in each and every item. And so when they talk about betterment, I can tell you for a fact, there is no betterment. My reputation's on the line. I put this together. There is no betterment. Now, there is something called standard, standard of industry. Okay. What was done in the 20s isn't done today. Cars don't have wood wheels anymore. Okay. If you wanted to relocate a car, and let's say you had to modify it, not that you did, you wouldn't put a wood wheel on it because it's not going to get past the highway, highway test or whatever it might be. Okay, so in the case of uh, equipment, it doesn't have to be the tortilla equipment. It just is in this case. We're going to put what is allowable to be installed. No more. We're not going to put extra. So uh, the complaint was, oh, there's some betterment because some of the equipment is now automated. That's true. But they had some automated equipment there. But what wasn't automated, they don't make anymore. And, and, the eight, and the low bid was Casa Herrera. They said, we can't install it. We can't stand behind it. We can't certify it. It's not allowed. There's all kinds of rules they got now that they didn't then, including Cal OSHA. So if something was said done by hand and it made 10, 12, and 14 inch size tortillas, we now have something that's 10, 12, 14 tortillas, but it's automated. It doesn't mean that it's, it's better. It just means that I'm replacing what they did there to there under today's standards. It, it's not that it's made out of gold or anything else. It's just restaurant equipment. So, and I don't take that lightly. I have to be very careful, very careful. My honor is on the line every time I do a project like this. And, and although I'm working for La Gloria here, I have worked for the city. They paid me. They, it's Caltrans has hired me direct. The rails hired me direct. Everybody's hired me direct. So I work both sides. And so it's very important to me to make sure that each and every job, no matter who I'm working for, that the numbers are accurate, they're fair, they're based on the low cost approach, that everything is open and you can see my documents. That's why I turn in five inch binders with the documents when somebody might turn in one or two pages because I'm completely transparent. And so when I hear betterment, I just, I just shake my head. A couple of more things, and I'll finish. And then I can answer questions, or I can go through them one by one. <laughs> There's been some denials that I just shake my head at. And it's because the city doesn't understand the code book. They see one document, and it says, well, we're not going to pay for it because it's a federal code, and therefore we don't have to pay for it. But they don't look at the other citations where it clearly says, no, they have to pay for it. And that argument I placed in writing in, that, in, in the appeal in the document for you. Let me work with one. We, we talked about the, the equipment where they're coming from is running on a 600 amps of, sorry, 800 amps of 480 volt power. Okay? Where they're going, they have 600 amps of 40 volt power and 600 amps of 240 volt power. So 
being the thorough guy that I am, it took me weeks to get a hold of the proper crews and managers at LADWP to schedule the meeting at the new site where it's important, not what the old site, nobody cares about that. And they came out and looked at it. And they walked through the whole thing, and, and I mean, it was a big deal. They had blueprints and radios going and all of that. They walked through, the, and they knew the facility very well. They've been there many times. And we're trying to figure out how we can put power into the building to operate the equipment. No more, but no less. The equipment's got to operate. That's the whole idea of relocating the equipment. And the city wants to tell you, well, they don't have to pay for that. That's crazy. In my 36 years, I've never once heard that. Of course, they have to modify the power. Now, nobody moves to a vacant building anymore uh, in relocation because the relocation guidelines and, and rules aren't really set up for that. They want you to move to an existing facility. So it does say in the code that if we're going to bring in power, what they call typical, which means, you know, uh, bring in the power, put a meter, and there you got power. That's not allowed. And he's right. That's not allowed. That's not what we're doing. We have existing meters. We have to modify the voltage and the power in order to run the equipment. If we didn't do that, the equipment wouldn't run. They'd be out of business. So what did DWP tell me? They said, well, we can do that. Of course we can. We're DWP. However, you know, we're really busy. And this is a big job. And we had a lot of other customers besides you which many times I'll then ask the agency, hey, lean on them, help me out here, give me some time. Pick off some time off the schedule. But they told me, hey, it's gonna take about a year, and this is what we want. They want all kinds of blueprints, and they want this and that, before they'll even talk to you. I took that to the city, and I said, hey, they want all kinds of blueprints, and they want all this stuff, and it's gonna cost you $100,000. And they said, no, don't do that, just, just draw the plans, and we'll go without it. So I drew schematics without, without the plans for DWP, and I, I let that go, because that's what they said they wanted to do. But it delayed us a lot. So in the walkthrough, uh, that's a very, very difficult situation over there. They got Metro built a line right down the middle of the street right in front of them. And they got train tracks. So right across the train tracks is, is powerful. And they, they can intercept it right there. They can go under the rain the tracks and come into the property with the proper power. Okay, that's a modification to the existing power. It's allowed. It's allowed. It, there's several codes that call it, and I stated it. I cited it so you could read it. Okay. Do we have any other options? Yes, we have another option. Right down there, we have a substation right down there. I walked down there, it was a quarter mile. Quarter mile. I go, this is ridiculous. And it, and it, but it, it, it's not going to be easy to go under the rail. Not going to be easy. But that is the cheaper approach. And I talked to them about cost and timing. And it was clear to everybody at that meeting, this was going to be. So that's the, that's the issue regarding the power and the equipment that's required. It's not a betterment. A betterment is if I just want to put something in there because I kind of like it. No, it has to be directly associated with equipment or personal property or, or trade fixtures that you're relocating. Only. Only. I know that. That's why my documents state that. There's no, there's no guessing. That's what it states. Okay. So I go through each an item, and you, they're there. His, his denials uh, are baseless. They're, they're based off the, the wrong codes. He's got some codes in there. They, they look right. But they're the wrong codes. They don't have an understanding of what it really means. Okay. For instance, uh, talk about making, making changes to the new property. If you're doing it for... Uh, aesthetics, or you're doing it because you want to, or let's say, let's say the, uh, the, the city building department said, hey, you know, you're going to have to reinforce that roof. That's not allowed. That is required by code, but it's not allowed in relocation. Okay? You can't just make an improvement to the building because you want to, or even because the code to told you to. However, if you're relocating a piece of equipment, let's say, and it's going to sit on that roof, yeah, you've got to modify that roof to carry that piece of equipment, and it is covered. You see the difference? If you have to modify the new location's property for the sole reason of installing a piece of equipment as required by code, yes, it's, it's included. It's, of course it's required. Of course it's approvable. And, it, and I have never had a job where it wasn't approved. Never. Okay? And, and as far as 
food processing plants. I can't say anybody in this room has ever moved one but me. Yes, I've moved them. I understand what it takes. I called the health department and went through every single thing that they wanted. And they want a lot. Okay? And as long as it's related to relocating the, the equipment, fixtures, of personal property, it's allowed. So um, I think that's about it. I don't really need to say any more. I could go through line by line. You have my responses. Um, I don't think it's, it's needed, but I'm, I'm here to answer any question you've got. So uh, I, I think what I'm most interested in at this point um, is I'd like to know um, from the appellants uh, I recognize, do we agree that there's a, a delta of about $1.9 million? Yes and yes. Um, what, Mr. Gates, Gates I was going to say Grades, but it's Randy, right? Randy. Okay. Uh, Mr. Gates, if well, What I'm interested in is an offer from the appellant um, that is somewhere in that delta that is um, that is uh, worth um, not going to, to federal court over. Um, and while you think about that, um, Mr. Jimenez, I have a couple of questions for you. Let's state one, one, a couple more things. I'm oh, sorry, and then I'll come yeah. back. Just a couple things. When we were in mediation, yeah. Mr. Jimenez kept saying he didn't understand the cost. He didn't understand the cost. That didn't surprise me because he's not a relocation expert. So who could? Right? Who could? So there was an offer made to move the case along if he could come out with his guys and walk the job with me. So we did. We walked them all around. And then when we got done, he said to me, okay, I, I get it now. I understand where the costs are coming from. And I'm going to get back to you within the week with an answer. That was two years ago. So it, 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 these cases handled right, the bids get turned in, they get approved in a week or two, they get funded, the process starts, the company moves, I hand them the key, the, the city comes in, knocks over the building, and they move on with whatever they want to build. And it's a win, 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 win. Okay? This isn't a win for anybody right here. This, this stalling and delaying and, and arguing about betterment, which doesn't exist, it's not helping anybody. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Jim. Um, so, Mr. Cummings, there, there you go. Do you want to come up? Of course. Um, and then let's take um, let's take a, a, a five minute recess if we might, um, Mr. Cummings. But what do you want? Five ten minutes? Okay, uh, we'll do that, and then we'll come back. Just for those listening on the, the record, I'm sure the court reporter would never never minds that. Um, so we'll take that, and we'll be right back. Okay, everybody, thank you for your patience. Going back online on agenda item number one on our agenda today for Monday, January 29th, 2018. Um, we had just taken a recess 
Uh, Mr. Cummings, uh, um, I, I guess I'm, I'm looking for uh, uh, a settlement offer of such from, um, from you and your client to resolve what's before us without you having to, to run over to federal court across the street. Um, I'm ready to give the number, but I, I note that John Minor is not here in the city attorney, so I, I, I don't really want to say anything until he, come, he, was, okay. he stepped out. Okay, I, I just think it would be imprudent. No, I understand. We can wait for him. Ted, he's your colleague. You, you know where but, he is? Um, I don't actually. I suspect he, his stuff is still here, so. Okay, we'll wait. Yeah. We'll wait. Yeah, I, I just yeah. think he stepped out for a minute. I can go try to find him if you want. Oh, well, one, I think one of his colleagues went to okay. go That's do that. Fine. Sorry about that. I, I didn't. I missed that. I thought you were waiting for your clients, so I, thought I saw them come back. So we'll wait just a minute. Okay. Thank, Thank you, sir. sir. Okay, we are um, going back on our agenda item number one today, Monday, January 29, 2018. Mr. Cummins for the appellant. Uh, yes, um, and thank you for this opportunity. Uh, what we would recommend is that the number be, for the settlement, $4,232,466. It's, it's 4 million. $232,466. And where we get that number is that's the original independent estimate of Ron Savark, which is Exhibit 9 in binder number 2. So that's the city's re relocation consultant. That's his number before there's any dealings with the, the city staff to lower the number. Um, okay. So what I would like to do is take another, really only five minutes uh, on, on uh, recess on this. Um, I have a number in mind. This might not surprise you, my number is lower. Um, but it has a basis, um, and I want to talk to um, uh, our team briefly, um, and I, I can't do it with my, all of my colleagues, because uh, I have to do it all on the record, which I will do once I get there, but I do have a question for our team before I before I go where we are. Okay, Thank you. so we'll take, maybe it won't be five minutes, maybe it'll be two minutes. Um, so we'll be uh, in another quick recess and then we'll be right back. Okay, uh, coming back on the record, um, um, 
on agenda item number one. Mr. Jimenez, regarding the $4.2 million and change proposal um, by the appellant claiming that this was Mr. Savark's number, I, you may have addressed this issue in, in your presentation, but would you respond to that? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Mr. Spark is a, is a consultant that reviewed the cost that was provided in the two bids. He is not a relocation expert and, ha and never claimed to have any expertise in relocation and determining what was an eligible, reimbursable item. He just looked at the cost and uh, uh, pretty much agreed that they were, that it would cost that much, but didn't make a, uh, an assessment as to the eligibility, which is really the problem at hand. Okay. So we're, we're, we're back to the elig elig what's eligible and what's not. The, the items that I see um, as the larger items regarding eligibility are the electrical services, and we heard Mr. Graves talk about that a bit. That's uh, the amount claimed is $324,000. Um, the amount approved by the city was $68,000 plus another uh, uh, $23,000. Um, is that right? I'm looking at attachment three. Correct. Okay. And then the next one that's big, I'm going somewhere with this, so be patient. Um, the next one that's big is health department related items at $211,000. That's correct. And then another big item. Uh, $491,000 for general contractor. $491,000 for general contractor. So I think I only came up with three there. There's others. But if you just look at health, electrical, and general contractor, you got a million dollars. And you're claiming, so, Udi, let's talk about, I, I'd like to hear, um, uh, and what, what my thought is, with their number on the table, I would like to make a counter offer today, and then I want to, um, unless it's accepted, if it's not accepted, if it's accepted, then, then we're going to be done. Um, if it's not accepted, I'm going to want to have one more hearing to try and crunch a little harder. And what I think makes the most sense is probably to have a special hearing rather than having these appellants have to wait to get on a Monday, Wednesday, Friday agenda. I think we'll do a, a Tuesday, Thursday special meeting so that we can get it done quickly um, and keep it as a one agenda item, which we were able to do today. But we can't do that very often. And it took them, they had to wait a long time to get this, I'm sure, so we can do something special quicker. But talk to, I'd like for you to give me um, uh, just kind of the, a couple of minutes on y the Bureau's feeling that the $411,000 of, of the, uh, what did I call it, uh, the general contractor is not um, eligible and then Mr. Graves can talk about why it is. But go ahead, sir. So um, I could just talk uh, on those high points that you just mentioned. Yes. Uh, so the electrical, the health, and the cost of the contractor and an administration fees, those are get, take a big chunk of what is being disputed. So um, what Mr. Gates and uh, talking about, for instance, in the electrical, uh, there was say, he was saying that electrical needed to be carried from a quarter mile away under the tracks and to the building in order to reconnect the machines. Well, the federal regulations clearly state that uh, what is allowed is to modify within the building the utilities needed to connect the, the, the machinery and 
this is not an allowable expense, so we did not include it. So the, the electrical is a big thing, and you have to consider that how much of that cost is taking electricity to the building. And I cited that uh, in, in the references that I mentioned earlier about the electrical. As far as the health question, that's two hundred and two hundred and eleven thousand dollars. That is a requirement of either the federal, state, or local law. And that's clearly a reestablishment claim. So of that two hundred and eleven thousand if you add the ADA compliance and all those other things, well over two hundred thousand dollars is last is is a reestablishment expense, and that's clear in the federal regulations. There's no, in my opinion, there's no debate about that. Um, so that was the electrical and the health and safety issues. Uh, that's a requirement by local law. Yeah, yeah. So um, total. Uh, that, that's a big chunk right there, the electrical and the health and safety. And lastly, administrative fees. So there's $150,000 for uh, administrative fees on the last page. Uh, it's actually 152000 And over and above that, uh, th there's a claim for $491,000 uh, that is uh, excessive and not allowable. Uh, there's nowhere in the regulations where that would be part of moving the equipment. Um, and typically the bids would include uh, profit and overhead and things like that. So this is, uh, for, for a job of this, even of this sig significant magnitude, $500,000 for this job for profit and overhead seems excessive. Um, so if you total those amounts, those uh, big ticket items, uh, that's a, a million two hundred and eighty-eight thousand five hundred and thirty-seven. So um, just those big ticket items make a significant dent into what what we believe to be uh, eligible reimbursable expenses, and uh, and the rest of it takes us down to about two point five. Okay. Uh, thank you, sir. Mr. Graves on Gates, I'm sorry. Or Mr. Cummins, whichever would prefer. I'm going to have Mr. Gates, re I'm going to have Mr. Gates respond, but I just want to put on the record, <clears throat> I took Mr. Um, Jimenez's deposition, and I've got excerpts on a video for you, in which he stated under oath that he's not an expert in relocation. He's not an expert in relocation federal regulations not an expert in California federal well, law. That, that, uh, we He's would, not an expert in any of these We're things. not going to dispute that. We're just, we're just trying to settle the thing. I understand. <laughs> I just want to want you to understand that his interpretation lacks a lot. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Gates. Thank you. So I'll address those three issues. First, the electrical in order. And the, the deposition was taken, Mr. Cummins, in the uh, inverse condemnation case? No. I mean, the... No, it was taken in the action where we had to get a preliminary injunction to stop the city from, from evicting us before you even had your hearings in this matter. The city filed an unlawful detainer action. We had to go in and get a preliminary injunction so we would still be in possession of the property. So one of the issues that would, we would as, as, uh, request your assistance in is an order that allows us to complete the relocation, which will take 12 to 15 months, no matter what number we agree upon. Thank Got you. It. Go ahead, Mr. And Mr. Gray. Mr. Cummings, just for clarification, that's Exhibit 27 that was entered into the record. The video that you're referring to. The well, yes, okay, that's correct. It okay. has been entered into. Yeah, the we record. got it. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, I was going to address the three issues that the. City and your staff, Mr. Gates, go ahead. Yes, Mr. Gates. Yeah. City staff had. Okay, so regarding the electrical. So there is some conflicting uh, wording that sometimes happens. However, in the code, again, he's quoting the wrong code. The code states 20, uh, 49 CFR 24.303, number C, excuse me, number A, connection to available nearby utilities from the right of way to the improvements at the replacement site, they're allowed. 
if I just wanted to install power for future, or it, was, it didn't have any power at all, that would be connecting to utility, providing a typical service, it's not allowed. But when you need a certain amount of power, either modified or installed or whatever, to run specific pieces of equipment that we are relocating, we're not buying it because we want to, we're relocating it, it's allowed. Otherwise, the equipment wouldn't run and you wouldn't have relocation. It's, it's a basic principle, okay? So he's quoting the wrong, the wrong code. Somewhere it does say, you know, within a building, whatever, but that's not what we're doing. And we are, and, and he, he kind of misspoke, maybe he didn't hear me. There were two options that DWP gave us. Go down to the substation and get it, or go under the rail right across the street. The cheaper approach was to go under the rail across the street. And that's the 300 and 200, well, uh, uh, was two hundred thousand dollars just for the oh this, it's DWP the claim piece. yeah I see claim for site work power upgrades right yeah got it okay so clearly the regs do allow it if you read the correct regs okay but I don't have any more to say on that okay, okay regarding health and safety yes that is a uh, a change to the new location something done construction wise they don't actually use the word construction okay uh, that's covered under. Federal regs and under Caltrans regs 10.05.05.06. What that means is this, and it's, it's also in my binder. What that means is this. If you have to make a change to the existing property for the specific reason of installing a piece of equipment, it is allowed. For instance, let's say I had a lathe that weighed 40,000 pounds and I had to install it. And it's required to have a foundation under it to support the weight. And the new location doesn't have that foundation. It's allowed. It's specifically allowed in the code. It's written. You can do that. Okay? So, uh, in the case of the health and safety equipment, I'm talking about health department, okay, they have requirements. Now, when you have a food processing plant, it is to a greater degree way more strict, as I spoke, than a restaurant. If you had a restaurant and you need to put a floor drain in the kitchen sink to wash it down, you could put a floor drain in, that's approved, and he, in fact, he improved the plumbing. Okay, but you would also have to slope it uh, a little bit, maybe three feet in either direction when the guy's washing it down so that the food and particles go into the drain, okay? In a food processing plant, they don't allow a little three-foot cut. They want the floors sloped to make sure everything gets off, all the bacteria, everything. You have to be sanitizing every day. So in the, the bid schedule that we provided, there are costs related to health and safety, not because we want to do them or, or because we just feel like we should, it's because they're required. And they're only required because we're reinstalling equipment from another location. They're both, they have to be directly connected, and they are. We didn't put anything extra. So that's my comment regarding that. Now regarding uh, administration, proper, whatever, uh, city make, staff makes a comment, um, you know, profit and overhead, they, 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 should, be, they should be included if it was truly a lump sum, it would be included and you wouldn't see it. But for clarity and for being transparent, I break it out. Of course it's included. I want to read a statement that's written into the um, code. Remember I told you earlier they don't allow estimates. Firm fixed bids is what they want. And it says, quote, a bid is an offer to perform a specific task at a specific price. It's a lump sum fixed amount that needs to be identified, okay? And it reads on. I find this a little bit arrogant, but it is what it is. Written in the code, quote, anyone in business must accept a certain degree of risk and the business profit is a reward for dealing with those risks. They know that the contractor is going to have overhead and profit. They know it. They state it right there. They're just saying, we want to make sure it's a bid and not an estimate because we're not going to let you give us an estimate, make profit, and then make more on a change order. There are no change orders in relocation. There are no change orders. There never has been. That's why my documents to all the bidding contractors states, you better get it right because there are no change orders. Excuse me. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so I think that's it. I uh, hope I've addressed those. So here's what... Um, you, 
What's the total? The total claim is about 4.3 something? It's now 4.5 due to delays. Oh, so. Yeah. I just want to be clear because I want to get a sense of where you all you came down from. The claim is for four million four hundred forty five dollars. I'm sorry, four million four hundred forty five thousand eight hundred ninety six dollars. Okay. So it's four um, four four five eight nine six. Right. So what I feel like from what I'm going to put on the table is we're moving in both parties are are moving in the right direction. Um, you went from 4.4 to 4.2, given change. Thank you, Mr. Gates. Um, I'm going to put a number on the table that I'm going to ask for my colleagues' support on. Um, I recognize that may not get us done today. That'll be up to you. But if it doesn't get us done today, what I would like to do is schedule the um, uh, a follow-up uh, session because it'll give us a chance to sharpen our pencil a little more and maybe you all a chance to see that we're serious, going to attempt to be serious about resolving this. Um, so, colleagues, my proposal would be that we uh, move from, uh, first of all, Mr. Jimenez, could I have you at the podium? Right now, the amount approved by the city is roughly 2 million, it is, $2,548,551, correct? Correct. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, so, colleagues, my proposal would be to add um, $600,000 to that, and I'll tell you why. So, I would put on the table three million one hundred forty-eight thousand five hundred and fifty-one dollars. Um, the additional six hundred thousand is based on the following. I am proposing that we not uh, pay the um, uh, the roughly seven hundred thousand dollars that is general contractor and general administration, et cetera. And so if you take that out, um, that leaves us with about, out of the 1.9, that leaves us with about 1.2 in the delta. And I'm dividing that delta evenly at $600,000 and putting $600,000 more on the table, um, recognizing that if necessary, I'm sure that with Mr. Gates's experience that he has that admittedly we don't have um, that we can back into that number and get the support we need. Um, so that's the uh, that would be our counter offer. We have both moved in the right direction um, to close the delta uh, by about as I can see eight hundred thousand dollars from where we were. Um, so, Mr. Cummins, that's. Uh, that's on the table for you all. You can let me know now. Um, you can let me know. Uh, my proposal would be, Dr. Campos, for a calendar, I would propose that we, um, and I know everybody's calendars are crazy, um, I would propose that we, um, do we have a, we could do this on a, one thing about Monday, Wednesday, Friday, everybody's calendars are already marked away for that. Do we have a Friday meeting that is light that you know of right now, Fernando, on agenda items? Give me one second and I will check right now. And then I'm, I have a hard out in two minutes.
you go. If you're looking for a Friday, Friday, February 16th, I have an extremely light agenda that date, and I can clear out all items from your um, from the table that date. So again, Friday, February 16th. Okay, uh, Friday, February 16th is okay with us. Uh, you know, I am uh, going to be out of the office, uh, out of town on that day, and I apologize. I do not like my own schedule to interfere with the boards. But well, we okay. So look, we're gonna, we're not gonna. Here's what we're gonna have to do. Um, let's, uh, let, Mr. Cummins. Any, let me, let me try this first. Any chance I can convince you to take the three point one? No, we, uh, we, we decline that offer. Okay. Well, thank you, sir. I, I saw at least a partial smile on your face, so I, I, I recognize that you appreciate our attempt. Um, so, um, with that said, then what we'll need to do, let's find a way through email with Mr. Campos and Mr. Mr. Cummins um, and, uh, and our city attorney, both of our city attorneys, we'll take any day. It can be, doesn't have to be Monday, Wednesday, Friday. It can be any day of the week. It can be, I'd like to get uh, another uh, uh, two hours or probably three hours to be safe. If we could get a three, if we have to get a, if we have more success getting a two-hour block, let's get a two-hour block. But if we can get a three-hour block, let's try and find a three-hour block any day of the week, any time of the day, um, for a special meeting that we will agendize to try and get this thing wrapped up. I'd be more than happy to work with uh, Mr. Cummings, but for the record, we can also make Friday, February 23rd, or Friday, March the 2nd. Those items are light. I just as feel well, like those so. may be farther out, but that's really up to the appellants. Okay, that's okay with us. Okay, that's okay with everybody. So Friday, March 2nd? Friday, March 2nd. And Mr. Cummins, just a, a message to you. We're, we're gonna work hard to try and resolve this. Um, so, um, and I know you will too. And I, I appreciate your uh, presentations today. And, and I appreciate your willingness to try to resolve the matter. Yeah. So uh, w one thing I would like to say, please remember in your resolution that we need to have time to do the work. Yeah. Because <laughs> we got to specially order this equipment. It's not something you can go into Costco and, and buy off the shelf. We'll, we'll know that. Mr. Jimenez? In that regard, um, we have some money available to actually do an advance payment so that some of the relocation work can start now, like ordering the equipment or whatever happens. He may be afraid that that means that he's waiving some rights he has. We, we've stated in the letter and in every co uh, communication where we've done that, that that does not preclude any, any sort of appeal. That's the, the right to waive an appeal. That's not the issue. We need to know how much money we're going to have before we can go out and contract. Because if the equipment's going to cost us two and a half million dollars, and we're only going to get 3.1 million, and, and the relocation is going to cost 4.4 million, that's not going to work. We're going to have to order something that's that's less expensive and not what we had before. So I'm saying it's not going to work. We, we we need to know what the number is, and then we can go order something special. Understood. Okay. okay. We're not trying to be... Understood. Be, okay. Understood. Thank you. We understand that. Thank you, Udi, for that. Um, we are um, continuing this hearing to March 2nd at uh, 10 a.m. Um, we will plan our, our, our agenda accordingly, and uh, we'll hold over till then. Um, and in the meantime, thank you, everybody, for your participation this morning. Uh, we are... Uh, the table is clear. We are adjourned.